Shalom. Welcome to the Shepherd's Light Online Church. Before the service starts, we wanted to invite you to join our chat. The chat is where you can ask questions, share verses, and connect with other viewers from around the world. Just write your first comment and choose the nickname to join. If you need prayer, click the live prayer icon and you'll be taken to a private chat where one of our team members will pray with you. The service is about to start. Don't forget to sign up so you can keep your username and profile. God bless you and enjoy the message.
place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. God bless you and welcome home. Rukim Habayim Abayta, welcome home. So good to be back again with you today and thanks so much for coming. We realize it's not always possible to travel to a service somewhere and to fellowship with the other people there. So we bring that service to you wherever you are. And we hope you'll be encouraged as you discover God's peace and His promises for your life. Now, would you open in your Bibles to the New Testament today? You remember, of course, how we say that in Hebrew. New Testament is Habrit HaChadashah. Habrit HaChadashah. And we're going to be again in the book of Mark in chapter 10. But this is the last day we're going to be in chapter 10. We're going to finish up that very long chapter today. And that's where we're going to be. And as you know, we'll also put verses up here for you in the video most most of the time. And just to make it easier for you to follow along, I'd like to talk to you today about not ashamed. You know, people today are so concerned. It's like they're walking on eggshells. They're walking on pins and needles trying not to offend other people. And it seems like there's some people that just get offended at everything. They see microaggressions. Forget regular aggressions. They imagine microaggressions in everything. Yeah. They, they call this racist and that racist and, and everything. I saw a cartoon the other day and it's a tree hugger hugging this tree. And the tree is saying, I need CO2. I need carbon dioxide because that's what trees breathe to make oxygen from it. And the tree hugger hears the tree say, I need CO2. And he goes, oh, great. I found a racist tree. 
It's amazing the things that set people off today, the, the things that uh, make people offended. You know, and it used to be if you didn't like something, you just walk away. If you didn't like talking to somebody, you just walk away, talk to somebody else. If you didn't like eating at a place, you just go somewhere and eat somewhere else. If you didn't like that a store sold Christian books alongside your secular books, some people would be offended. They would try to boycott that store and put them out of business. The days used to be that you would just go somewhere else and buy the books that you wanted and everything. Why are people so offended all the time? But what it's done is when people are always talking and finding fault with you about every little thing you do, every little thing people say and everything like that, they're not very resilient. I don't know how they're going to survive in life because life can be hard sometimes. And if you're, if you're trying to boycott everything that's causing you any degree of problem at all, well, you're not really very well prepared for living life. But it has an effect on the people of God. The people who believe in the Messiah and the Jewish people, all the people who believe in the biblical God, and Jesus the Messiah, sometimes feel ashamed to talk about their faith before other people because they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to offend anyone. They don't want to say something that might offend somebody else. Well, one day you're going to stand in the kingdom of heaven if you're a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus, if you're a believer in him, you're going to stand in the kingdom of heaven and you're going to notice that those people that you did not want to offend maybe aren't in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you did not want to tell them about the hope that you have in Yeshua HaMashiach, in the Messiah. They may be looking at you thinking, well, like that guy is a pretty good person. And he's never talked about Jesus. See, I can live without believing in Jesus. And then they die and go to hell because they thought that you were a good guy or that you were a good woman and you never told them about who it is that's making you that way, Jesus. When you try to keep it hidden that you're a believer, you might be concerned about offending them right now. But how are both of you going to feel in that day before the judgment seat of God when that person is cast into hell and you're allowed to go to heaven? That's pretty offensive. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's what brings life, everlasting life to people. So don't be worried about being offended. You need to be bold and not ashamed when you talk about the gospel. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in our message today. Chapter 10 of the book of Mark, we're going to finish it up. Just only seven more verses to go. It's a short message today. Well, let me say this. <laughs> Those of you who know me, he goes, it's a short message. Did Stephen say it's a short message? And they go, oh, really? I've never seen that before. But it's only seven verses, and we'll see if we can't, uh, see if we can't snatch uh, victory from the jaws of defeat here by uh, and uh, letting the Lord give me just, just the right words succinctly to say in a shorter amount of time. So let's begin now at chapter 10 in the book of Mark, verse 46. And as always, we'll stop every once in a while and talk about what those verses mean. And here we go. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It says, Now they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Now, okay, Remember last week when we talked about this, <clears throat> Jesus and the disciples were walking on their way to Jerusalem. 
And Jesus was very determined to go to Jerusalem. He was walking on ahead of the disciples. Usually he would kind of hang back and walk in the group of the disciples, and they weren't really in any particular hurry. But last week we noticed that he was he was determined, and he's up there leading the disciples, walking on ahead. And then he's talking to them about how uh, he's going to go to Jerusalem and the religious leaders and the Gentiles are going to take his life and he's going to be killed, but then he's going to rise again from the dead three days later. And the disciples are looking at him going like, he knows they're going to kill him, and yet he's eager to go and do this? What What's going on here? <clears throat> and what's going on there is Jesus looked down the telescope of time God knows the future, you see. He looked down the telescope of time and he saw all of the millions and millions and even billions of people that would believe on him and be saved and be given everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. And he saw their faces in the kingdom of heaven full of joy now because they believed on him and now they have everlasting life in the most beautiful place imaginable, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, everlasting life. Think about that. Joys unbelievable, joys unimaginable, joys that never end. It just never ends the amazing things that God is going to show you in his kingdom. No more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more hurt. God is going to have you as his children and watch over you and take care of you. And if you already believe now, guess what? He's already started watching over you and taking care of you. But now we start at verse 46 and they're still walking on their way to Jerusalem. And it says that the disciples in Jesus came to Jericho. Now, you remember the walls of Jericho and the book of Joshua, and they marched around the city, and God told them to shout real loud on, the, on this march that they had been doing for several days. And this time when they shouted, the walls of Jericho, a very highly fortified fortress, the walls came crumbling down. They didn't have to lift a finger. They didn't have to put ladders up. They didn't have to go to war at all. God fought their battles for them. And now... The disciples and Jesus are coming to Jericho. Now, a few thousand years later, the disciples and Jesus are coming back through Jericho. And it says, as Jesus went out of Jericho, in verse 46, with his disciples and with a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Now, Bartimaeus literally means in the Hebrew, the son of Timaeus. You say, no, Stephen, Ben means son, Ben Yehuda, Ben Yamin, okay, the son of my right, the son of Yehuda. Uh, but Bar also means son. So when you see a Bar before the name like that, Bar Timaeus, that means he is the son of Timaeus. And he sat by the road begging. Well, it says he's blind. Now, consider this. They didn't have Braille in those days. They didn't have audio recorders. They didn't have a uh, signal at, uh, to help you cross the street to where you can press the button and it would count down until it's time to walk and then says it's safe to cross the street now. Cross and then starts counting. One, two, three. Three, and you know you have 30 seconds to get across the street. And if you're blind, you can still hear that. So you're feeling with your cane, you're walking across the street. But blind Bartimaeus in these days, 2,000 years ago, didn't have such conveniences. Such technology didn't exist. Blind Timaeus couldn't do work. He couldn't hold down a job. He couldn't see what it is that he's supposed to do. He couldn't walk to the places he needed to walk to. He couldn't talk with other people and see the things that they were seeing. So there was really almost nothing that he could do and work at a job. So he was reduced to sitting by the road and begging. And so we see this now. Jericho is about 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's on the Jerusalem side of the Jordan River. It's interesting now, what we're going to read in the next couple of verses, 
It says in verse 47, when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth passing by, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But many people started warning Bartimaeus, it says in verse 48. And, but he cried out all the more. They told him to be quiet, but he kept crying out even more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now picture this. Bartimaeus' world was sitting by this road, blind, begging for food, begging for money. What the beggars would do is they would take off their garments, they would put it on the ground before them, or they would put it on their lap, and people come by, and when they see that that beggar has no food, no way to work, no money, or any way to support himself, they put some coins, they put some money, and drop it down on the man's coat. And the man's coat is sitting, sitting there, mostly on his lap, and they drop the money in there. So at the end of the day, he can feel around, collect the money there, put his coat back on and take the money and buy some food to eat so he will not die of hunger. And so this is the life of a beggar. But think about some of the other aspects of the beggar's life. You can't see anything. You're blind. You can't see what other people see. You only hear things. You hear the sandals hitting the dirt and the dust as they walk by you. You hear people's conversations with each other. You hear the horses off in the distance coming by and snorting a little as they clop down carrying the wagon behind them and towing it along. And you hear what people are talking about. But this time there was a big commotion. There was a big uh, talk. A lot of people had gathered together. There was a, a multitude passing by on this main road. Now, Bartimaeus was used to a lot of people passing by on this main road. At that time, Jericho happened to be the halfway point between northern Africa and all of Europe. So a great amount of trade would pass through Jericho between northern Africa and Europe. The foods, the supplies, the things that they made in Africa, the things that they made in Europe would go to Europe, would go down to Africa. And all of these things would be traveling. This was commerce in those days. And that was the main way to get between the two continents, Africa and Europe. And it all passed through Jericho. So this was a very, very busy road for sure. So Bartimaeus would hear all of this. But today, it was different. Today, Bartimaeus is hearing a multitude of people. They're not talking about the usual conversations that he hears them saying about where they're going to go next, where they're going to stop, where they're going to eat, who's going to buy their products, who can they sell their products to. He doesn't hear that. He hears these people just kind of following along in this huge crowd following along this one man who's walking in front. And he hears the man's name as his disciples and others are talking about him. And the man's name is Yeshua, Jesus. Now, Jesus, in the Greek transliteration, is the same word used for Joshua. So Joshua and Jesus use the same roots there. Now, they sound different, don't they? Well, they are. But in Greek, they took the name Yeshua and they turned it into Yehoshua or G Joshua. And so there, uh, he is Joshua, really. I mean, to them, to many of the Greeks and everything, his name was Yehoshua. You see the similarity. Yeshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yehoshua. And so it means salvation of God either way. It's just depending on if it came from a Greek origin word or from a Hebrew origin word. But that's how you pronounce the English word Jesus, the English name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. And in Greek, they were calling it Joshua. Okay, 
And so basically, Yehoshua is Joshua. Jesus is now there. In a way, you could say, well, wait a minute. There was another Joshua that passed through that town thousands of years before, a couple of thousand years before another Joshua passed through, and that's when the walls of Jericho crumbled. And it turns out that it was also the place where Joshua had his most famous battle that the Lord def defeated his enemies for him. And in that battle, Joshua prayed that the sun would be still so that he had more daylight to fight the enemy, you see, so that they could rout the enemy and finish the battle. And God caused the sun to stand still. Now look at what happens. Verse 48, we see Bartimaeus. People are telling him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's heard about Jesus. He's heard about the healings that Jesus does. And now he's crying out to Jesus, have mercy on me. And look at the next verse, verse 49. We're going to talk about that one for a little bit. So Jesus stood still and commanded Bartimaeus to be called to him. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Jesus stood still. 2,000 years ago, that Joshua asked God to make the sun up in the sky stand still so it could still be light so the battle could be won. Now this second Joshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Jesus, has come and he stands still. And he commands Bartimaeus to be called to him. And Jesus stood still so that the light of God could shine on the people and they could see what Jesus is about to do. Joshua, 2,000 years earlier, asked God to make the sun up in the sky stand still. And it did. Now, blind Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus in humility. And in pain and agony, he's desperate. He doesn't want to sit on that roadside begging all the rest of his life. He hears that Jesus is passing by. He's heard of all the travelers speaking of the miracles that this man Jesus is doing. And how God is with him doing these mighty miracles. And that he is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. The Lord has come and is doing all of these miracles. And now Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is passing by. He cries out in desperation, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Some people in that day and even today think that Jesus, I'm a pretty righteous man. Jesus, I'm a pretty righteous woman. I think you should do these things for me. You should heal this sickness that I'm going through because I've done righteous works. Basically, what they're doing is they're proud of themselves. But the Bible says in the Tanakh that God will bring the proud low, but that he exalts the ones who are humble. Blind Bartimaeus isn't say, Jesus, life is unfair. Look at what happened to me. I'm blind. Everybody else can see. Why did you do this to me? He didn't say that. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. By saying son of David, he knew that Jesus was being called the son of God and is the son of God. And Bartimaeus believed on Jesus as the Lord and the Savior, the son of God. But he calls him saying, Jesus, son of David. Why? David was just a man. Jesus is the son of God. But he's also called the son of David in the Tanakh and the prophecies. And so Bartimaeus is saying, you're the son of a man. You know what it's like to be a man and have all these sicknesses and illnesses. You know what it's like to be disappointed. You know what it's like not to be able to see things for people like me who are blind. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus heard this. Now, in verse 49, the other amazing thing here is that 
Jesus was surrounded by multitudes. They were all crying out, hollering after him, trying to get his attention, trying to get him to heal them and do these things and seeing what he was going to do next. Some of them were following him because he had made food out of nothing and fed them with a few loaves and a few couple of fish. And he fed five, ten, sometimes close to 15,000 people just out of thin air. And he did these miracles, and some were following him because they wanted to be <laughs> given these free groceries <laughs> every day. And so they were following. Others were curious. They were going, what is this man all about? Why are these thousands and thousands of people following him? So they're tagging along too, looking in curiosity. You know, there's three kinds of people in life. There's people that make things happen. And then there's people that watch things happen. And then there's, and then there's people that wonder what happened. <laughs> what happened? Makara, what happened there? And so, you know, blind Bartimaeus was kind of like that third person. He's wondering what's happening now. And then he finds out it's Jesus. And he just makes his move right then. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And just like Joshua cried out to God, 2,000 years earlier, and the sun up in the sky stood still. Now, blind Bartimaeus calls out to Jesus, God, and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the son of God stood still right there before blind Bartimaeus. So Jesus told the people, bring Bartimaeus here. I'm sure the disciples probably looked around Thousands of people following him, hundreds of people yelling out his name, trying to get to him. But somehow, Jesus singled out the little weak voice of blind Bartimaeus. He wasn't standing, so he couldn't just look over the heads of the other people and find out where blind Bartimaeus was. Blind Bartimaeus was sitting on the ground, begging with his coat with his few coins that had been dropped in there out of mercy and compassion. He was sitting there begging. Jesus wouldn't be able to see him, but Jesus heard the voice. And he commanded for the disciples to bring Bartimaeus to him. And look at what it says then in verse 49, the second part. It says, Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise. He's calling you. He's calling you. <laughs> they, they certainly didn't expect to come back to this little man sitting off the side of the road, this beggar who no one could see. Everyone's yelling at Jesus and for him to stop and do something for them. But blind Bartimaeus says, have mercy on me. Some of the other people were no doubt thinking like, Jesus, I've done so many things for the nation of Israel. You should heal me. Now, Jesus, I'm very important in the political government of Israel. You should heal me. Jesus, I'm a friend of this very important king over here. You should heal me. But Jesus didn't say anything to them. Instead, he hears blind Bartimaeus saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, bring him to me. They call the blind man. They say to him, be of good cheer. Good news. Be of good cheer. <laughs> Rise. He's calling you. Look at what happens in verse 50. The blind man Bartimaeus throws aside his garment. He rose up and he came to Jesus. He's probably running into people as he goes. The, the uh, disciples have him. No, this way. No, not that way. This way. Careful. Don't step on that little child there. No, be careful. Their little dog is in front of you. Okay, come this way. We'll lead you to him. They lead him to Jesus. And you think about what's happening there. And he gets before Jesus. Jesus answers and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Do you remember those words? In our message last week, James and John <clears throat> asked Jesus if he would do something for them. And his reply to them was, what do you want me to do for you? And they answered, oh, well, we want to sit at your right hand and your left in your glory. One of us at your right and one of us at your left. 
And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. He says, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? In other words, are you able to give your life for the kingdom of God? And they said, yeah, yeah. He said, are you able to do what is going to happen to me? Are you able to go through that and suffer through that? They said, yes. He said, but to sit at my age, said, you will be baptized with the baptism I'm going through. You will suffer. You'll suffer because you're coming in my name and people don't like that. You will suffer. But to give you the seat at my right hand and my left is not mine to give. He was saying the Father will give it to those whom he has determined need to sit at my right hand and my left. But look at how he started that conversation with James and John when we covered that last week. He said, what do you want me to do for you? And now blind Bartimaeus, another man is standing before Jesus. Jesus once again asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, in other words, my rabbi, my great one, my master, that I may receive my sight. Notice the difference. Now, James and John, when they asked last week of Jesus, well, 2,000 years ago, but we talked about it last week, when they asked of Jesus that they could sit at his right hand and his left, he said, no, you don't know what you're asking. That's not mine to give. That's for the Father to give, and we'll see who that is, but <clears throat> it's not mine to give. And the rest of the disciples saw what James and John were asking, and they, the 10 remaining disciples were probably going, who do they think they are? They obviously think they're much better than we are. And there was this division. Because you see, that's the way the world operates in politics. Who's greater? Who gets the better position than everybody else to where everybody can see that they are better than all the rest of the people? And so the people, the other 10 disciples, were offended when James and John asked last week. But now the blind man is not asking for position a power. He's not asking for authority. He's not asking for wealth. He's not even asking for length of life or anything else. He just said, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, my master, Rabboni, which is just a way of saying my rabbi or my great one is what Rav means. Rav means loud or great. Rav is, is how you would say rabbi. Okay, in Hebrew, so uh, in Rebbe, of course, in, in uh, Yiddish and everything for the Ashkenazim or the uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews. But Rabboni, when you see that I on the end, the E on the end, Rabboni, that means my. So my great one is what he's saying. The blind man says, he's basically not saying, I'm great, so you should do this for me. He's saying, you are my great one. He says, I just want to receive my sight. And we go on through in verse 52, the last verse that we'll cover today. And Jesus says to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now, I want to tell you, there's probably a half a dozen sermons that could be preached just on this last verse right here. Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. We've been talking about people who try to justify themselves. Well, Jesus, I've been doing righteous things all my life. You should do this for me. Jesus, I'm a, I've got a friend who's, a, who's very high up in the government. You should do this for me because I'm important too, because I'm his friend. Jesus, you should do this for me because I've always given my tithes. I've always done all of this, trying to justify their way to God by their works. But Jesus didn't say that to Bartimaeus. He said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. What is faith? Leha amin. I believe. It says in Genesis, in the Torah, chapter 15, verse 6, God said, and Abraham believed God, and that was counted to him for righteousness. My religious friends, Datim, Orthodox, my friends, my brothers, listen to this. Atayadeh she'ani Yehudi, nechon, hamishpacha shali Yehudi. 
אני מבין, אני מבין מה אתה אומר. I understand what you're saying, but the Bible says, the Torah says in Genesis 15:6, Abraham believed God and that was counted to him by God as righteousness. Not the works he did, but that he believed God. What is faith? When you believe what God is doing and what God has said, you have faith. faith in God. Jesus says to blind Bartimaeus, go your way, your faith has made you well. That's one message right here in verse 52. Look at another one here. Jesus tells him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received a sight, stop right there. He says, go your way. Now Jesus is looking at him. He's given him a healing Blind Bartimaeus is standing up, receiving his sight, looking at things he hadn't ever seen before, looking at things that used to make those sounds that he would hear in his ear, and he's just amazed. And Jesus said, go your way. Blind Bartimaeus probably has a thousand things he wants to do now that he's got his sight. But look at what he chose. Jesus said, go your way. And it says, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Blind Bartimaeus put aside his way. He said, Jesus, I've got a thousand things I'd like to do, but I want to follow your way. I want to follow you. I'm going your way, Jesus. Jesus said in, in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life And no man comes to the Father but through me. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Blind Bartimaeus is saying like, oh, I've got plans. But all that's not important. I believe you. Look at what you've done for me. I was just asking for mercy. He probably would have been happy if you could just make me see things for an hour. so I can find what it is that I've been listening to all these years. And, and then I remember what they look like when I hear them in the future, even if I become blind again. But Jesus heals him. Bartimaeus had come to him asking for mercy, not because he deserved the favor of God, but because he didn't. And he asked for mercy. Listen. Listen. If you don't deserve the faith of the goodness of God, and none of us really do, if you think about all the things you've done wrong in your life, even the thoughts, the hidden thoughts of your mind, the evil thoughts that you've had, we've all had them. You have sin in your life. Therefore, none of us deserve the goodness of God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's in Abrida Chadesha, the New Testament, in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Bartimaeus knows that he is not worthy based on righteous works. And even if he had some righteous moments, He quickly looks at the other things that are in his mind that he cannot forget. And he goes, it doesn't matter. I'm still an evil man. I still need help. I've still sinned so many times. So Lord, I'm not righteous. So have mercy on me. He had been asking people to have mercy on him when they dropped coins in his coat. But notice what happened when Jesus called for him. He got up. He sprung to his feet. He's trying to find his way to Jesus. He throws his coat away. It's got all of his money that they've been dropping in it. That's not important anymore. The things that used to be important to him, the things of this world, how he's going to eat, how he's going to do this, what he's going to buy, what his plans are, those aren't important. He throws it all down on the ground and runs toward Jesus. Jesus, and they're trying to keep him from running over things because he's still blind. And Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus 
on the road. In our scriptures today, we've seen the story of blind Bartimaeus, a man whose eyes were opened not only to see the things around him on the road in the city of Jericho, but also to see the things of the kingdom of God, the things of eternity. And the most important thing you've learned from God's word today is, if you're not ashamed of Jesus in this present life, he will not be ashamed of you when at the end of your life on earth you stand before God the Father. Here's why I say that. Blind Bartimaeus was yelling out for Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Yelling very loud. And the people were telling him, be quiet, don't bother the master. Be quiet, don't bother the master. But he didn't care what other people thought. He wanted to know Jesus. He called out to the son of God. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. But some people today don't want to offend other people. Hmm. Oh, well, I'm a believer in Jesus, but that other person doesn't like to hear about God. So I'm not going to tell them about Jesus. Uh, I'm not going to tell them how Jesus changed my life. I'm not going to tell them how Jesus gave me hope. I'm not going to tell them how Jesus took away my shame and my guilt. I'm not going to tell them that because I might offend them. But by you not telling them, that's the greatest offense if they don't hear the story of eternal life through you. How will they know? Are you here like Esther in the Tanakh? Are you here right before that person every day at work? That person that comes across your path? That person that you were thinking you don't want to offend? Are you here because God has sent you here to tell them about everlasting life by believing on the Son of God? So what happens if you don't tell them? Will they go to hell without that? God could bring somebody else. But what if this was their last chance to hear? And God sends you, but you don't want to offend them. When your time has come and you stand before the throne of God, God will let you into his kingdom because you believe on his son. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You will live forever with him. Because when people told you to be quiet or told someone else to be quiet, not to talk to you about Jesus, they were not quiet, but they continued to tell you, and now you're a believer. Now, when you tell others about Jesus and someone says, be quiet, don't talk to me about Jesus, Someone else says, don't talk about Jesus. It's not politically correct. You're offending people when you talk about Jesus to other people. So stop telling people about Jesus. Be quiet. Just like they told Bartimaeus, be quiet. But Bartimaeus kept going and calling out to the Lord and calling on the Lord and telling others all around him that he believed that Jesus was the son of David, the Messiah, Son of God, the Lord. He believed that. So you continue telling others. Don't you worry about offending them. That doesn't mean that you have to just keep talking to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Tell them the gospel. Tell them the gospel again. Make sure every opportunity where they're asking you what reason for the hope that is in you, make sure you tell them what it is. It's like, well, I eat real healthy. Uh, I practice yoga, and that's why I'm happy. And I go to the Pilates class and everything. And I, I follow this person on social media, and that's why I'm happy. Come on. We're not talking about the few days you have in this life here on earth. We're talking about everlasting life. When people are curious about why you are happy and have peace in your life, You tell them it's because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because Jesus came and took my sins upon himself and the Son of God 
now has given his life as an atonement for me and my sins are gone and I'm on my way to heaven. That's why I'm happy. That's why I have peace and you can have it too. If God can save me, believe me, he can save anybody. Don't be ashamed of the Son of God. Don't be ashamed of the Son of God. Why don't you give your life to God today? Completely, right now. If you call out to Him, He'll hear that cry. He'll answer you and He'll rescue you from the darkness you're in. He'll shine His light on your heart and you'll be given everlasting life, new life. He'll change you into a new person like that. He'll throw away all those past failures. You'll be made completely new. All that shame and failures will be thrown overboard and you'll sail away with the wind of the Holy Spirit putting you over now to a new place that you're going to be going to. Life's going to change. You're going to be given a new start, be made completely new, and He'll give you everlasting life in heaven. And that's guaranteed by God Himself, my friend. I want to give you an opportunity today to believe on Yeshua, Jesus as the Messiah and Lord, and to receive this peace that we're talking about, God's peace, lasting peace in your life. You can be saved and given everlasting life by, in heaven by simply believing, by simply believing. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. You simply believe that God sent His one and only Son into the world to save us from judgment. That Son's name is Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. You just pray something like this. You can repeat it after me if you'd like. But don't just say it because it's somebody's prayer that they made. You mean it from your heart. You take it. You own it. You bring it into your life. You mean it because you're not saying it to me. You're not saying it to somebody else. You're saying it to God who looks on the heart. That's what the Tanakh says. He looks on the heart. Some people can say words. They can read from a siddur, read their prayer. And while they're looking around and everything at who's buying what or what's going on around them in the city and everything, but their heart is not into the prayer. You pray this and you mean it from your heart because God, it says in the Tanakh, looks on the heart. Just say something like this. God, I do want to know you and have real peace in my life. I believe on your son, Jesus, the Messiah, as Lord. Please forgive all of my sins. I give my life to you and I thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I'm very pleased and happy to tell you that God heard you. And even now, He's already started working in your life. A little seed's been planted deep down in your heart, in fact. And over time, you're going to begin to see the wonderful changes that God's making in your life. A little seed's not going to do anything for a few days, but it's putting out roots. It's soaking up the, the mineral content of the soil around it, the moisture down below those roots. And after a short time, it's going to break through that ground and reach for the sun. You're not going to notice it until that little green twig breaks through the ground, turns into a huge tree over time. That's what God's going to do with your life, the changes He's going to make. You get in a good Bible-based church. You learn about Him every day in His Word. You talk to Him every day in prayer, just looking up to Him and say, Abba, Daddy, my Father in Heaven, you talk to Him. You're His child from now on. And He is going to do beautiful, wonderful things in your life. Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Oh, 
Oh 